Associate Vice President of Academic Affairs, Dr. Michael Vieira. Thank you. I'm actually here representing President uh, Jack Sprager, who is kind of upset that he's not here because he's a historian and he really is into, uh, into the topic. So he, he asked me to specifically give his regrets to his colleagues and the uh, distinguished colleagues in the audience. Um, and I also bring the greetings of uh, Dr. Sarah Garrett, who is the uh, Chief Academic Officer and Vice President of Wells, who was detained. And I'll be able to stay for a little while, and then, of course, in keeping with my life, we have another meeting coming up, so I'll have to sneak out a little bit. But I'm, I'm very happy to be here today um, to introduce uh, Dr. Greff. C. Morgan Greff's work has been focused on interpretive program development, curriculum alignment, and grant writing um, to fund the Rhode Island Historical Society's work in this area. Um, her goals are similar for both areas, to create engaging, dynamic experiences related to Rhode Island's history for learners of all ages. Does this sound familiar? <laughs> uh, the, <laughs> the RIHS programs and units are grounded in primary documentation from the 17th through the 21st centuries. In all areas, they strive for better representation of understudied topics and populations. Dr. Greff's specializations within American history are prison history, African American history and literature, 18th, 19th century domestic life and interiors, and otherwise her overarching field is museum studies and practice with an emphasis on interpre interpretation and implementation. At her core, Dr. Greff <laughs> explains, is a goal to help people un better understand the past of all individuals in a hope that if one can develop a sense of historical empathy, one can also begin to experience empathy and sympathy for others today. In addition to serving as director of the Newell D. Goff Center for Education and Public Programs at the Rhode Island Historical Society, she's an adjunct assistant professor of history at the University of Rhode Island. She earned a PhD in American Civilization at Brown University, both an MA and BA in American Civilization at the University of Pennsylvania, and as you already know, her talk today will focus on the New England slave trade and uh, especially Rhode Island connections. So join me in a nice BCC welcome for Dr. Griff. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you, both Herb and Eric, for inviting me today. And thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, today, we're going to be talking about three main points. One. New England, and particularly Rhode Island, um, and their role as premier players in the colonial transatlantic slave trade. Two, that they made even more of their money from what is called the provisioning trade. And lastly, we'll spend most of our time looking at one particular journey, the 1764 voyage of the Sally, one slave trading voyage that connected three continents, 10 countries, and countless individuals throughout New England and the colonies. In the centuries that followed Columbus's discovery of America, some 12 million Africans were carried into enslavement in the New World. Only about 500,000 of these men, women, and children were brought to what is now mainland North America. Vastly larger numbers went to places like the Caribbean and South America, with Brazil alone accounting for 4 million of those 12 million individuals. In Brazil, they realized something relatively quickly, and that was that for their sugar plantations, it was more economical for them to import more captives and work them to death than it was to import people and allow them to generate on their own. The slave trade was, in fact, history's first global economy and global industry. Ships from Spain, Portugal, England, France, Holland, and Denmark as well as from North America, plied the entire African coast. They would fill their holds with captives, knowing that when they arrived in the West, in the West Indies and in the American South, they would make eight to 10 times their money back. But slave trading was a very deadly business as well. Estimates range from 10 to 25% of all of the men, women, and children put into the holds of these ships died in their voyage to the New World. In 1807, British Parliament and the United States passed bills formally abolishing the, slave, the transatlantic slave trade. In 
But while they passed that bill in 1807, it took more than 50 years for the actual transatlantic slave, slave trade to stop. Today we'll be talking, as I mentioned, about the New England connections and the Rhode Island connections in particular, but I've tried to bring out some of the Massachusetts connections a little bit more strongly um, to this transatlantic trade and, as I said, the provisioning trade as well. Over time, the men who participated in the slave trade learned how to maximize their profits. They came to understand the tastes of their trading partners, the best seasons of trade, but also the number of calories it took to keep these captives alive in the holds of their ships. This was the height of science at that time. They developed even greater techniques for packing their human cargo as efficiently as possible. Gir girls were typically allocated four feet, six inches in length by 12 inches in width. Boys were given a little bit more space, about five, inch, five feet by 14 inches, and adults a little bit more. The plate that you see here, and throughout the talk I've tried to incorporate as many images as I could find about these voyages and from this period. This is actually an image from a 1764 text produced in France that was uh, created by abolitionists to gain sympathy for the abolitionist cause. In the top image you can see a European man leaning forward to lick the chin of an African man. He's doing this for two reasons. One is because they believe the taste of their sweat, if it was sour or if it was sweet, would indicate if there was any kind of illness. It was also a way for the traders to get very close to these men and tell if they had beards or not. A young, beardless man would be worth more money in the West Indies. They'd have a longer lifespan in the West Indies than if they were older. And in fact, people on the coast were known to pumice off the hair to make the slaves appear younger than they were. In the lower image, you see a long boat that's bearing Africans to the main uh, ship on its way to the West Indies. And you see those left behind weeping. Abolitionists would, show, would use this uh, image to show that the heartlessness of the businessmen who were involved in this, but also the humanity of the people who were left behind. Often, justifications for slavery were couched in terms that they were better off or that we were civilizing them, that they, weren't, they didn't have the same human emotions or feelings that we did. This was a way for them to illustrate that that was not the case. Here are some of the pictures that you've probably seen before. You have, with the green background, the common practice of how slaves were loaded onto these ships. You can see that they're in very cramped quarters. But more famous is the image, the white background, that's actually a reform image. Most people today think that that image shows the horror of how people were packed together. In fact, this is a suggestion for how to do it better and more humanely. So this was a way to efficiently pack your holds with human beings, how to maximize your profits while giving them enough space. One of the most overlooked but lucrative aspects of the slave trade is what's more popularly known as the provisioning or West Indies trade. And this is where people like the Browns made the majority of their money. The West Indian islands are what many historians refer to as uh, having a staple crop economy. This means that largely the entire economy of a region or an island is based on one crop alone. That crop in certain areas was sugar. It could also be coffee. Some areas it could be cotton. And we see this also in the American South. But in the islands it was very profound. So you would have a whole area devoted to, let's say, growing sugar and they would not diversify their economy in any other way. So they weren't growing food to feed people who were working the fields. They would not raise horses, that would take up too much room. They would not make furniture because that would waste someone's labor. So everything that they needed to live on a daily basis for both the enslaved peoples and for the plantation owners and masters had to be imported from places. And they were imported from places like Massachusetts Rhode Island and Connecticut, and later New Jersey. And they became known as grocery colonies. 
So we provide the, the materials that keep them going. So goods would be grown and made here. So the hinterlands would, we would raise some kind of product. It would then be brought to a manufacturing center, produced like furniture, put on ships, and sent to the West Indies or the American South. We often think as rum as one of our greatest exports. And this was, of course, you know, made famous in, in song in 1776. But in fact, rum had a larger and more kind of homegrown competition. And that competition was from something so ubiquitous, it was simply called fish. And that was the cod. And we can see here two young girls posing with a cod that their father had recently brought in. And these here are just barrels of, of rum in the rum museum. Massachusetts made an almost inconceivable amount of money off of the codfish trade. And were in fact referred to as the codfish aristocracy, were the men who made their wealth in cod. The pictures you see uh, up on the screen are of Jeremiah Lee of Marblehead and his mansion, which you can still tour today. And it's probably one of the most impressive early American houses that you can see. It's absolutely astounding and a testament to the amount of money that you could make in provisioning. Marblehead was the leading port. And Lee married into the Hooper family. The Hoopers were the, the leading family, and King Hooper was the man who made Marblehead what it is still today. Copley painted this portrait of Lee, and who died not long after the revolution began. But he left this impressive house. When John Brown's son went to visit Marblehead, he wrote about the house. There is one elegant building, late of the property of Colonel Lee. He reported, there is the front is 64 by 45 feet, the entry through the middle 17 feet, the staircase and banisters of mahogany. The house is elegantly papered in the fashion from England and made on purpose for it. The marble white Italian on the whole is more superb than any house I have seen in North America. The money in cod fishing stayed in these families in Massachusetts and in Rhode Island and was invested in the industry that began to grow there. It was not until the late 20th century that fishing ceased to be a way of life for many of these communities. Well, Massachusetts dominated the codfish market, Providence merchant John Brown, who we'll be learning a lot about uh, today, wanted to make sure that Rhode Island was not left out. So in the 1780s, Brown purchased 16 schooners, which instead of he naming, he simply lettered A through P. And in 1786, John Brown's 22-year-old son, James, and future son-in-law, John Francis, were dispatched by John Brown to check on his fleet, which he kept in Marblehead. John Francis reported, these vessels are manned for the banks and eight men and boys, with eight men and boys, and sail the latter end of February to the middle of March on their first fair. The fourth and last fair is completed October to the middle of November. The first fish, cod, caught are called Sable Island fish and command a price of 24 to 26 pounds per pound and are sent to the Bilbao market, where they never fail to ensure a good profit. No other vessel, except a few in Salem and Beverly and Cape Ann, ever sail so early to catch and salt those fish with the proceed, which precedes their value. The other fares are divided by sworn inspectors into Marblehead, Merchantable, and Jamaica fish. The former are shipped to Europe the latter are salt burnt and go to the West Indies. And this became the distinction. There were three types of cod that Massachusetts men were catching. Now, Mass we might think of cod as you know, sort of the frozen fish that we all get at the store. At this period, they're salting cod. In fact, fresh cod is not even desirable in most markets. If you're shipping cod to Spain, they don't want fresh cod. They want salt cod. So the codfish industry had been going on since from the Grand Banks for hundreds of years now. And there was a great market for it in Spain and in the Mediterranean as a whole, all the way up, in fact, to Scotland. But they wanted this salt cod, and they knew that they could get a good price for it in those markets. The next grade down will be shipped back to the North American colonies. So people like the John Browns of the world would be eating that level of cod. 
the other stuff, the small stuff that got left on the decks. It got burnt in the sun. It was the worst kind of possible fish that they could have that they would salt again and pack into barrels will be sent to the West Indies to feed the slaves. And that was known to the Rhode Island and Massachusetts traders as Jamaica fish. In Jamaica, it's known simply as salt fish, which means other things in Jamaica today, but we won't go into that. Um, so here in this picture, you can see the main way that cod was fished for hundreds of years. It wasn't until the 20th century that this starts to change, and that's on a schooner. And it was thought that this codfish supply would never run out. In fact, in the 19th century, scientists said that it is impossible for codfish supply to be depleted. They simply will keep reproducing. In fact, the waters of the banks were so filled with cod that they could walk across the ocean on the backs of the cod. The area where these men are plying their trade is called the Grand Banks. For any of you who saw um, uh, The Perfect Storm, this is the kind of fishing area where they were. And um, from Massachusetts, they're going out to the closest one to the American coast, which is called George's Bank. They would bring the cod back. They would split the cod in half. And there were a lot of manuals to teach people how to split it properly so they'd retain their price. And then they would spread them out on beaches, on sandbanks, and salt them and let them dry in the sun. And that's what you can see there. All of that looks like kind of paving stone. That's all cod. And people made a vast fortune in this provisioning trade. So they're sending everything down to the West Indies. Cod for the slaves to eat, higher quality cod for the masters to eat, horses. Narragansett Pacers were one of the prized horses on plantations because they were so nimble. Finished products, all the sorts of foodstuffs that you can imagine, beef, pork, all of that for the masters, all being brought in. And in fact, many of the captains would go and spend time in these areas. And this painting from 1752 to 58 by John Greenwood is one of the more um, debaucherous images of the captains of this time period. And it is actually called Sea Captains Carousing in Suriname. As we can see, if you look closely in the corner, you can see up there, there's a man vomiting, peeing in the corner. Another man there who's passed out has um, one bowl of soup being dumped on his head and another man uh, vomiting in his pocket. And they're surrounded by very small in the painting, ill-dressed slaves who are serving them. What's so interesting to people about this painting is that 10 of the individuals in the painting have been identified by historians. Six of those 10 were trustees of Brown University. <laughs> and two of them went on to be governors of Rhode Island, including the man there uh, with the pocket full of vomit. So we're very proud to say that is Governor Joseph Wanton. And in fact, Stephen Hopkins and his brother Isaac Hopkins are pictured in this as well. Stephen Hopkins also being a Quaker. So what did we get from this provisioning trade? We understand that we're sending a lot of stuff down there. But they're not giving us money to bring back, right? They're trading goods for this. So one of the most important things that we can get, and this will come back later on in the talk, is that tree, and that's a mahogany. Mahogany grows in tropical climates. So it grows in Asia, it grows in Africa, in places like Nigeria, but it grew in abundance in the Caribbean islands and in South America. But if you needed your economy to be based on something like sugar, you needed ground to do that. So the plantation owners would clear cut, as they called it, stands of mahogany to clear out the entire fields and they needed to do something with all this wood. So they put that on ships, and they'd send it back to places like Boston and Newport. And there, master carpenters would turn it into things like the Joseph Brown desk, some of the most exquisite 18th century furniture that exists today, comes from those plantations in the West Indies, was carved here for the merchants 
who funded the West Indies trade and sometimes was sent back to their plantations in places like Cuba that people such as the DeWolfs owned. So we're going to move on to the main part of what we'll be talking about for the rest of today, and that is the Briggs Sally. The Brown family had been involved in the slave trade for quite some time. In fact, Captain James Brown, John Brown's father, sent the first slave trading voyage out of Providence ever. 1736, he sends the Mary with his brother, Obadiah, as the supercargo. Comes back with a success, successful voyage, but the slave trade out of Providence doesn't really catch on. Newport and Bristol are much better at that. About 30 years goes by, 25 years, and Obadiah decides he wants to try again. So they send out in 1759 the Wheel of Fortune. Just my personal recommendation, if you're taking a risky voyage, let's not call it the Wheel of Fortune. <laughs> Things don't go really well. Um, and in fact, it's 1759, which probably doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but it may be to some of you who have taken some European history classes, that's smack in the middle of the Seven Years' War. This was not a safe time to be heading out to sea and dealing with all of the issues inherent upon this. And in fact, this British flagship was taken by French privateers and turned out to be a financial and personal disaster for the Brown family. But in 1764, the Seven Years' War is over. And John Brown decides to convince his four brothers, well, there's four of them, one of them passed away, sadly, the three remaining brothers, that the four of them should go in on their first slave trading voyage together. And that voyage is the Sally. They've never done this before. They've never orchestrated a whole thing on their own. But they needed money. They were creating, um, they were creating uh, an iron foundry. They had their new candle works they needed money for. So they decided they needed capital and they needed to do something. So at this time, when they're deciding to do this, the enslaved population of Rhode Island was about 10% of the total population. Connecticut's was, in fact, higher at 13% at the same time. Massachusetts is a little bit lower, but only because it was higher in certain parts of the state, but very low out in western Massachusetts. Worcester County has a, a minuscule slave population, and towns like Northampton have one enslaved person. So it's hard to get an accurate figure for Massachusetts. But for Rhode Island, it's 10% of the population, with cities like Newport and Providence being higher still. And in fact, in Rhode Island, because they don't become the big cod fishers that Massachusetts are, they focus on rum. And there are nearly 30 rum distilleries in Rhode Island at this time, 24 of them alone in Newport. So what they were planning on doing is loading up their ship with goods, including an incredible amount of rum, to then ship to Africa to buy or trade for slaves. Now, Rhode Island alone brings 100,000 enslaved people to the New World. So it's a little bit hard to kind of figure this all out because North American colonies never become the big players in the slave trade that places like Portugal and England are. But if there was a ship, you're on the west coast of Africa, and there's a ship and it's from the colonies, there is a 60% chance that it's from Rhode Island. So for the smallest colony, that's a pretty significant amount of their economy. And in fact, it's almost impossible to find a Rhode Islander at that period who is not in some way working in this slave trade. So as I said, this voyage was undertaken by the Brown brothers. And these are two of the only images that we have of the Brown brothers, the dashing uh, gentleman who looks a lot like the Black Adder over here <laughs> is John Brown. And this is a, a drawing of Moses Brown. We actually don't know what Moses looked like. And his portraits are among my favorite because not only are they based on hearsay or based on other drawings of him, but all of the portraits of the front of him are based on a line drawing of him from behind. <laughs> so, I don't know how accurate that is. 
Yes, he was, he was a Quaker, and as you can tell by the hat and the oatmealish quality of him. So the Browns are the first citizens of Rhode Island, and John and Moses are the youngest two. The brothers involved are Nicholas, Joseph, John, and Moses. And by the standards of Rhode Island even, they were not major slave traders. But in fact, John becomes on to be one of the most ardent defenders of the slave trade in the US Congress. He also, again, because they made so much of their wealth off of the provisioning trade, were significant to the perpetuation of slavery. So the Brown brothers are new to this, and they don't quite know what they should be doing or who they should be going to, but they have a friend in Isaac Hopkins. And he's captained their privateers for them. He's been in the West Indies trade for a long time. He's a very accomplished captain. But he has never been to Africa, and he has never been on a ship involved in the slave trade. And the Browns are counseled by friends in Newport. They say, please, just wait. Wait for a captain who knows what he's doing. This is a dangerous place and a dangerous trade, and you don't want to go with, as they called him, a green captain, because he's just going to mess things up. We know he's your friend. We know you're close with his brother, but don't do it. But sadly, they did. So this is an image, and one, one thing I should say is all of the images that are involved here with the that look like the, the kind of the paper images, the documents that are used in this, are all available online through Brown Slavery and Justice Committee. And so anything that's in here can be found and looked at and is transcribed online as well. So here we see a list of the crew of the ship. Hopkins assembles a crew of 15 for the Sally. The ship's articles specify the duties and the wages of each of the hands, and the crew actually includes one man of African descent, Edward Abbey, who it turns out is actually Isaac Hopkins' slave. And this is not an uncommon practice. You would see an enslaved person brought aboard a ship, and you'll see that he's supposed to get paid. But he never actually gets paid. That money that is his salary goes directly to his owner. So Isaac Hopkins brings Ned Abbey on board, and he gets paid for his labor. It was the custom on a slave ship to offer captains and officers what's called a privilege. A typical privilege would be four on 104 slaves. And what that meant was for every 104 captives that you secured, you were allowed to sell four on your own account. So you would sell 100, and that money would go to the people who, who arranged the voyage. Four you got to sell on your own. But it's pretty clear that the Brown brothers thought this was going to be a very successful journey because they offered a much higher privilege to their friend. 10 barrels of rum on the out outward journey and 10 slaves on return. And all the officers on this alley were promised the privilege of 20 slaves. One of the most fascinating documents to me is the outfitting of the slave ship. Before the slave ship could depart, in the port in Bristol or in Newport, the ship had to be prepared for that voyage. And that meant it had to be prepared for the men who were going to be on the ship on their way over, for the captives who were going to come back with them, for all the people that they were going to meet in between. And lists like this, which actually go on for pages, detail every single thing that went on that ship. So we're going to go through a little bit of what was listed on that document and look at what it was, and more importantly, I think, or more interestingly to me, where it came from. Because it starts to show us the scope and the reach of the provisioning and the slave trade that was going on. So not surprisingly, from Newport, they had approximately 17,275 gallons of rum. So just a little bit. And this rum is going to be for the men on their outbound journey and their journey back, but also to trade when they get to the coast. They have to feed the men while they're on board. They bring 30 casks of bread. And you can see they even detail that they got all of this from George Gibbs, a Newport baker. They also have one large iron pot because they're going to need to cook or soak some of the salted food that they've brought with them. <laughs> 
they bring 24 barrels of beef. Now, meat in general was much more available to people in the colonies than it was in Europe. So it was well known throughout the region that in America you had meat. And in fact, during the Revolution, um, when the British were kind of cornered there in Boston, one of the British soldiers apparently reported that he, you know, they asked him which side he was leaning towards, and he said he was on the fresh beef side of the question. And basically that meant that we had access to these foodstuffs that other people didn't. So for the ships, they would dry it, make a sort of a beef jerky. They would also put it all in barrels. In South, and most of this beef came from South County, which is interesting to note that many of these cat, this cattle came from South County plantations that were also being worked by enslaved people who were brought back on journeys like this one. They also brought with them 1,800 onions. At first, this seems a little bit odd, um, a good stew or something, I don't know. But in fact, onions are of incredible importance on a ship. And many onions come from places like Wethersfield, Connecticut, where onions were their kind of stock and trade, or Bristol, Rhode Island, another onion center of New England. Onions were used for a lot of medicinal purposes. They were used as a cough relief for colds, used as poultice for drawing poisons from wounds and ulcers. They were also used on the soles of feet to reduce high fevers or placed on the chest to relieve congestion. Ancient remedies included using onion tea to relieve cholera, fevers, and headaches, as well as treatments for gout, arthritis, soothing burns, and speeding healing. And perhaps most importantly, they now believe, scientists have now realized, that onions have an incredibly high vitamin C content as well. And sailors need vitamin C as an, what they call an antiscorbutic, or it fought off scurvy. So instead of having the lemons or limes that we might think of as an antiscorbutic, they're using onions. So these onions, in fact, are not necessarily for eating. They're basically for everything. While they're on the coast, they're going to anchor off the coast of Africa. They don't kind of pull up to the dock. They anchor off the coast with a large number of other ships. And while they're there, they're trading with these other ships that they meet up with. Some of the popular things to trade are sugar, which of course the Brown family is going to have tons of because of its connections with the West Indies trade. So they're bringing back things from the West Indies that they know they're going to use on their next outward journey. And they also bring 40 barrels of flour. So that is, again, for their own consumption, but also for trading with others. They're also bringing 25 casks of rice. Rice was brought to North America by European colonists in 1694, and it quickly became Georgia's staple crop. South Carolina was the second in its production, and we know from the Browns traveling to the West Indies, but also to the American coast, that they have direct trade with Georgia and with South Carolina. So that rice is not homegrown. They are bringing it up from provisioning and then sending it out with the men to then trade in Africa. They're also bringing 10,000 pounds of tobacco. Beginning in the 17th century, British colonists started growing tobacco, shade or Indian tobacco as they called it, in Connecticut particularly now uh, near the town of Enfield, which is in what's still called the Tobacco Valley. This tobacco was not as prized as the tobacco that was being grown in the West Indies, particularly in Cuba. So it's not known to us at this point in 1762, because in 1762 they began growing Cuban tobacco in Connecticut in small amounts, if the Brown family would have been shipping shade tobacco, or they would have in fact been importing tobacco from Cuba and then shipping it out. The shade tobacco wasn't considered nearly as good, um, and there wasn't as high a demand for it, but the Browns weren't always known for having the best material, just the most of it. They bring with them as well 96 pounds of coffee. And this picture you see here is actually of a, of a 19th, 18th century coffee husking machine in Puerto Rico, known as a Piladora. So this would have been used all throughout the West Indies and South America to prepare the coffee to be exported. 
So you can see very little of the material that's going on the ship is actually coming from New England. It's actually coming from all over the North American colonies and the islands to ship out yet again. So places like Rhode Island or Massachusetts are acting as a go-between for these islands. They have with them 300 iron hoops. So iron hoops like these would have been used to make barrels that were incredibly important. If a barrel should break when you're on the ship, you need to be able to make new ones. They brought with them cut wood. They brought Cooper's tools and carpenter's tools and Abraham Hawkins, their carpenter. So he could actually act as a cooper when he was on board, but he couldn't act as a blacksmith. So they would have to bring all of their iron hoops with them. And they also brought with them 30 boxes of spermaceti candles from their Brown family spermaceti candle works in Providence. Luckily, the Browns had one sister, Mary Vanderlight, and she married a man from the Netherlands who happened to perfect the technique for making spermaceti candles. So they set up this spermaceti candle works, and they actually have relationships with Nantucket and then New Bedford and places like that in the whaling industry, where they get the spermaceti, which is the head matter of a, a sperm whale. They import the head matter and then create these spermaceti candles, which were known to burn longer and cleaner than the tallow or animal fat candles that were being used at the time. So while Rhode Island also didn't become as important as Massachusetts in cod fishing, they also never became as important in the whaling industry. So these side businesses, like candle manufacturing, relied upon raw goods from Massachusetts. They had with them medical supplies from Dr. Jabez Bowen, Jr. of Providence. Ships were required to have medical supplies on board. The larger British ships were required to have doctors on board. But Rhode Island ships were so much smaller that they just had to have a medicine chest. And it would have been a small chest, mahogany chest, like the one you see here. And they would have used this to help sick crew members, officers, and occasionally contagious captives who were on board. Remember that they have, in their estimation, invested a lot of money into this, and they don't want people dying. So that's these medicines were used for everyone on board, and often included things like laudanum, which is a mixture of rum and opium, and calomel, which is um, mercury, which, as we now know, less helpful than they would have liked. Um, and so this is all they would have had for the entirety of that journey in and out. They also had with them items for control, which included 40 handcuffs and 40 shackles, as well as seven swivel guns. The handcuffs and shackles would have been made by blacksmiths in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. And they only have 40, not because that's all they expected, but because the men, cap male captives, would have been shackled together. So this would have been enough for 80 men to be shackled together. Women and children were often left unshackled on Rhode Island ships and were given what they call the run of the ship. So they were kept below decks during the day, segregated by male or female. But, a, but during the day, they were above board, the men shackled together. The swivel guns are kind of even more troubling, but very important in this period. Now remember, the last voyage the family had undertaken had been taken by pirates. So swivel guns are like small cannons that are mounted on the outside of a ship. So you can imagine another ship is coming at you. You're able to stand and fire upon them because these little cannons swivel from one side to another. But more importantly than that, they also can swivel and turn inward because they knew, the Brown family knew, that insurrections were increasingly common on the coast. So these swivel guns as well as the cutlasses, pistols, small arms, everything else that they brought with them were in case of insurrection, even mutiny. But more importantly, if, a, if the slaves should rise on them, they could use the swivel guns to fire on them. So this is what they would have done to prepare themselves for what is now commonly known as the triangle trade, or when misspelled, the triangle trade. <laughs> so this is actually a European image. So it shows them going up. But you can see so the manufactured goods going to, to Africa from Europe or North America, the slaves going to South America, the islands, and the American South, and then the other materials from, the raw materials from the islands going back to New England and to Europe. So they've made the journey across, which would take about two months for them at this point. And they 
arrive in Africa in November of 1764. Hopkins opened his account book on November 10th, exchanging a few gallons of rum for wood, corn, and chickens, as well as a small tooth, which is actually an elephant's tusk. He purchased his first slaves five days later, for which he traded 156 gallons of rum and a barrel of flour for a boy and a girl. Slave ship captains sought to fill their holds as quickly as possible. Long stays on the African coast often proved disastrous, not just because there was a higher risk of insurrection when you were close to the coast, for obvious reasons, but because diseases were rampant. And things like malaria and yellow fever would kill the crew as well as the captives. So they wanted to get off the African coast as quickly as possible. But unfortunately, the Sally arrived at an extraordinarily bad moment. As I mentioned, the Seven Years' War is over. And the Browns had thought this is a great time to get back into the slave trade. And apparently, everyone else did as well. So when they arrive and drop anchor in November of 1764, there are at least 30 other vessels there, 24 of which are from Rhode Island. So at this point, the rum market is glutted, and the captive market is scarce. And Hopkins has no experience. And that becomes incredibly quickly apparent to the people on the African side of this trade. Hopkins eventually fills his cargo hold with 196 individuals. But it took him nine months to do so. So that boy and girl that he got in November of 1764 were in the hold for nine months before even leaving for the West Indies. The slaves got to the coast in a way that's sort of different from one of the popular visions that we have from things like roots. There weren't raids by the traders, like Isa Hopkins wasn't going into the interior of Africa. In fact, because of wars that were occurring throughout the African interior, warring nations and factions would take prisoners of opposing communities. And they were brought up the river in these shallow kind of longboats, sort of like canoes, and brought frequently to what were called trading castles or trading posts along the coast. The man in charge, the king of the area, often called the Alcade, was stationed in those trading posts or that trading castle. Some of them you might, heard, might have heard of are Elmina or Cape Coast Castle, which are two of the larger ones in this area called the Bight of Biafra and the Bight of Benin. And these are the areas where the Rhode Island traders were going. So they would meet with the Alcade, and they would often meet, as Hopkins notes, under the palaver tree. A palaver is actually a term that was used throughout the, the world in this moment, throughout the European trading world, meaning negotiation and exchange. So it could be for anything. It's not particular to the slave trade. But what you would have to do is perform kind of an elaborate kind of ritual over beginning this trade. And that's what those five days of exchange and gifts were. You would not only need to give gifts to the African kings, but also to their entire retinue. So over the course of those five days, Hopkins dispensed hundreds of gallons of rum as gifts and custom to the king and his members of his entourage, including his geographer, his high constable. And then the king allowed them on that fifth day to open the trade. We can see from documents like this that they're trading the rum that we would expect, but they're also trading things like guns which if you've ever read or heard about the book Guns, Germs, and Steel, we see the importance of trading these firearms with these communities because that makes the community with whom you're trading even stronger. They can go out, they can go into the interior, and in their fights or wars and disagreements, they have the upper hand, and so it allows this cycle to continue. So through trading weaponry, it encourages this process. They're also trading, as I said, on the coast. As other ships are anchored off the coast, they're running out of food, they're running out of flour, they're running out of medicine, and they're trading with each other. But they're also trading slaves with each other. So they might say, OK, if you give us one of your boys, we'll give you, um, we'll give you this cask of flour that you need, because they might be dealing with a retinue that wants flour. 
And so there's an incredible process of negotiation all up and down the coast in these ships through these series of longboats that make this exchange possible. On June 8th, 1765, seven months after the Sally's arrival on the coast, Hopkins purchases his 108th woman in exchange for an assortment of rum, snuff, iron bars, cloth, cutlasses, guns, and gunpowder. Later that afternoon, the ship's longboat returned with 10 more captives. It was Hopkins' most successful day trading. But on that same day, there's a very small notation on the bottom of this page here that if you read carefully reads, quote, woman slave hanged herself between decks. She was the second enslaved person to die on the ship. The Sally finally embarked for the West Indies in August 1765. Of the 196 Africans that Hopkins had purchased, nine had been sold on the coast, 19 had died, and the 20th had been left for dead. Three of the crew of the 15 had also perished. But the horror had only begun. In the first few weeks at sea, four more people, a woman, a girl, and two boys died. On the eighth day out, the slaves rose in rebellion. There's a very terse comment by Hopkins in his logbook. Quote, slaves rose on us, was obliged to fire on them, and destroyed eight, and several more badly wounded. One thigh, one rib broke. Following the failed insurrection, the trickle of deaths became a torrent. The slaves were so dispirited, Hopkins wrote, some drowned themselves, some starved, and others sickened and died. As the Sally approached the West Indies, Africans continued to die on almost a daily basis. Their bodies were unceremoniously thrown into the sea. The ship's account book lists 109 deaths in all. Hopkins spoke of starvation and despair, but in fact, the speed with which people were dying suggests a much more mundane but horrible cause, which is bloody flux. It's a disease that was transmitted through human feces, it produced violent diarrhea and eventual death through dehydration. And you can see if we go back here that this is actually the number now that are dying as the number goes up. And at the end, it's the 109. So you can just see in his handwriting there, died, D-Y-E-D, -E as it just goes one after the other. One woman died, one man slave died, one man, one woman died. In the West Indies, Hopkins first sailed to Barbados, hoping to find instructions from Nicholas Brown and company, but he found none. So he went back, kept sailing, and went to Antigua, where he sold what remained of his cargo. They were so sickly and emaciated that they fetched incredibly low prices. Surviving papers from the voyage include two bills of sale for the 36 Africans, as well as a letter from an agent who handled some of these sales, apologizing for the disappointing returns. He wrote, I am truly sorry for the bad voyage. Had the Negroes been young and healthy, I should have been able to sell them pretty well. I make no doubt if you was to try this market again with good slaves, I should be able to give you satisfaction. The voyage of the Sally was a severe financial setback for the Brown brothers. They consoled themselves, however, with the survival of their friend Hopkins, who they in fact thought had perished and had been given word from another captain that he had died while in Africa. They wrote to him, we need not mention how disagreeable the news of you losing three hands and 88 slaves is to us and your friends. But you continuing in health is so great a satisfaction to us that we remain cheerful under the heavy losses of our interest. The four brothers responded in very different ways. Nicholas and Joseph, Joseph never being much of a businessman, were terrified by the amount of money that they lost and felt that this kind of venture was just too risky and not worth the financial speculation. Moses, after, in 1773, and the death of his, suffering from the death of his wife, had a kind of conversion moment where he realized the horror of his actions. He became a Quaker. He started the Providence Abolition Society, and he manumitted his slaves and became one of the most outspoken people against the slave trade in New England. In fact, writing the first law banning the slave trade from Rhode Island and then from the United States. 
John, however, never deterred from losing money or a struggle, is the only brother who continued participating in the trade. It's estimated that he participated in perhaps six to nine more journeys. But as I said earlier, he became the most ardent defender of the slave trade and, in fact, was elected to the U.S. Congress, where he fought against the abolition of the slave trade. So while Moses penned the law banning the trade from Rhode Island, the first person tried under the new federal law is his brother John in a lawsuit brought by his brother. And they went on to have one of the most interesting battles of letters that you can possibly see from this 18th century period of the slave trade. John said he wouldn't give it up, but when he, if he should ever be moved by the Spirit of God to learn that this was incorrect or immoral, that he should certainly give it up the way that Moses did. But he thought that, frankly, the slaves seemed to be better off when brought to the islands in North America, despite the fact, of course, that he knew very well that the average life expectancy for a slave in Barbados was under seven years. But the slave trade does end in Rhode Island, and it ends in Massachusetts, much to the chagrin of John Brown, who dies four years before the abolition of the slave trade goes into effect in the United States in 1807. Moses continues till 1835, dying at 96 years old, still an avid member, leaving in his will $500 for the perpetuation of the Providence Abolition Society, knowing that his nephews even, who joined the Abolition Society with him, were now members of Rhode Island's Anti-Abolition Society. So the fight continued in Rhode Island and Massachusetts the more they invested in the cotton textile industry and the more that Rhode Island and Massachusetts wealth was directly tied to the plantations that they had earlier supplied with captives. So how can we still see the slave trade today? One of the most obvious ways is the fact that in places like Rhode Island and Massachusetts, we have an incredibly rich diaspora of people of African descent, people who come from North American in slavery, people who come from the Dominican Republic, from Cape Verde, from all over the country who have had their own experience being the ancestors and survivors of people of the trade. But there are other more subtle ways and subtle things that you can look at on our landscape every day. One of the, you can look at the cobblestone streets of Newport, which were paved with duties on the heads of every slave that was brought in to the city of Newport. You can look at the beautiful college buildings in places like Harvard and Yale and Brown that were built not just by the wealth that the slave trade and the provisioning trade brought, but also by the hands of enslaved men who were rented out, if you will, to build these and construct these beautiful edifices. But you can also look at the beautiful mahogany that graces the colonial and early American homes of today that shows the sign that these, the wealth these men made. It is, in many ways, not to be melodramatic, stained with the blood and the sweat of the enslaved people who worked those fields and who manned those ships and who brought that back to the United States, and many of whom who learned to be those master carpenters and those master craftsmen. So that mahogany holds a dear value not just because it represents the craftspeople who learned how to make something as elegant as that corner chair or the business acumen of people like John Brown, but because it represents the connections between Africa, the West Indies, and New England, and the horror that was the provisioning trade and the slave trade. But one of the most interesting ways to me that's a little bit harder to see even still, but something that many of us consume all the time, is through the cod. As a child in Bermuda, my family would offer us traditional breakfasts all the time, and that traditional breakfast was toast with a banana smashed on it, covered with salt cod, and then sprinkled with egg yolk. It's disgusting. <laughs> but it was traditional. In Jamaica, salt cod is still preferred traditional food, as it is in Puerto Rico and throughout the Caribbean and the Bahamas. But there's no cod in the Bahamas. That cod was North Atlantic cod, and that tradition is there because it was slave food, because it is the food that sustained the men and the women who worked all of those fields. It has become a staple food of the culture of the people who worked those islands. So that cheapest of food has turned into something that we pass on from one generation to the next, that we remember as indigenous 
to that culture when in fact fresh fish abounds and surrounds these islands and their diet was mainly salted fish from off the coast of Massachusetts. So thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please let me know. The Wolf's Tavern, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. That was formerly, uh, uh, I was amazed when I was told by the person who was describing it, that the ship actually came up the, the, the alley that's on either side of, the, of that building and unloaded. Unloaded. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if you uh, came across any literature that attested to that. A lot of, there, there is quite a bit of documentation about the DeWolf's family's activities and that, that wharf and warehouse in particular. There's some speculation as to whether or not that particular warehouse was one that was used for enslaved peoples or not, but it probably was a, a multi-purpose space that could have been used for anything that they were bringing in. And the DeWolf's actually are the most um, prolific slave traders in North America. So whereas John Brown has sort of gained a lot of that reputation, most of the Brown reputation is based on the fact that they kept immaculate records and he had an incredibly big mouth. So he talked about all of this all the time. The DeWolfs end up coming into the trade a little bit later than John does. They start getting in in the 1780s and 1790s and in fact make the most money after it's illegal. So they continue well past that, false flagging their ships. They also own a large plantation in Cuba. So they're incredibly diversified. So they're, in fact, raising their raw materials in Cuba, bringing the, importing their own molasses, making their own rum, shipping that themselves. So they're both vertically and horizontally integrated. And they had a number of these warehouses. So yes, that warehouse is, historically speaking, a warehouse that was used in that time period by the DeWolfs while they were participating in the trade. And now you can have lunch there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> mentioned that uh, in Warren, that he was aware of the fact that there are in the basement on a building on Water, Water Street, uh, cages and shackles still in that basement. And I, uh, I, I where, where are you? Where are you? There, are, there are many rumors and legends to that effect. In fact, most of them don't pan out to be true. I mean, I don't want to say unfortunately. I mean, I'm glad that these things aren't there, but, um, but many of them, the same rumors exist about, let's say, the John Brown House in Providence. And in fact, they didn't even have a basement where that could have taken place. Um, but there are, there are, I think, one of the reasons why, I think actually about this quite a, a bit, because so many people want to find tunnels and cages and shackles and these sorts of things. And I think much of it is because there, are no, there aren't as many obvious markers. When you're in the American South, the connections between um, slavery, you can see Confederate flags, you can see slave quarters, you can see plantation houses, you can see what we think of as the visible signs of enslavement. In New England, there aren't as many blatant signs of that connection unless you're really paying attention to the fact that every street, every house, every brick, every piece of mahogany is in fact a sign and a monument to that trade. It just doesn't look as horrific as we want it to. But in fact, the signs are everywhere. I mean, we are completely in, you know, in a city like Providence or in Newport, the communities we live in are built by people of African descent. And you know, the, the signs, the kind of the, the difficult and painful signs of it are just harder to find. So I haven't been to the place in Warren, but I know that many of the, many of the statements are, are, over, are overstated. <laughs>
And Massachusetts, so is it Massachusetts? Uh, no, Rhode Island. Rhode Island? I'm, I'm okay, and Massachusetts has far more um, connection to the Underground Railroad um, than in fact Rhode Island does. In Rhode Island, there are only 12 sites that have ever been verified to be part of the Underground Railroad, in fact. Massachusetts are far more, and, and places like Fall River and New Bedford are quite interesting because New Bedford in particular becomes a hotbed of, um, of abolitionist and, um, and Underground Railroad activity, whereas in Rhode Island, it's much, much less. Well, in colonial times, the place I'm talking about mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true, and and so it, it's a it's a fascinating thing, and many people say that the connection between Rhode Island is much less related to the Underground Railroad because our connection as a whole state with the cotton textile industry is so much greater, and so people who are in the cotton textile industry are having a very hard time proposing abolition because of course they're getting their cotton from the South. And so if they are abolitionists, they're, they, they're afraid they're kind of shooting themselves and their profits in the foot. So there's a lot of very interesting debates and arguments that are going on. And as somebody like Moses Brown starts the Abolition Society, he is also at the same time investing in his new business, which is the creation of what would become Slater Mill. So he creates Slater Mill and he espouses the importance of moving towards industry because it gets people away from the merchant trades away from the slave trade. And many of my students will say like, well, he didn't even know he was being such a hypocrite. No, he knew. I mean, it would be hard not to know because he had his brother writing to him saying, oh, this is really interesting. I wanted to wish you a lot of luck on this whole cotton textile business. Um, so I'm just wondering where you're getting your cotton from because I don't think I know of any cotton that's not grown by slaves. So how is this working for you? And so, in fact, his, he never responds, Moses never responds to that letter in writing. Who knows, they could have talked about it. But, um, but it was this distinction he was making and saying, well, slavery is just a consequent evil of the slave trade. So if we stop the slave trade, it, it'll, it'll die out on its own. But of course, we know that the cotton textile industry makes sure that it's not going to die out on its own. So it's, it's quite a, a fascinating web that these um, men and women of this period are walking as they're, they're making vast sums of money off of a system that some of them are at the same time decrying. So it, it's, a, it's a fascinating place um, and part of history to look at and try to sort out while not kind of castigating people as good or evil and just trying to understand the complexity of what they're trying to figure out and how Moses is trying to extricate himself from this trade, but just finds himself deeper and deeper involved in the perpetuation of this institution he hates. So I, I think it's just really fascinating all in this, this whole area. Anyone else? Yeah. Can you just say you could find the primary sources down at EDU? The primary sources can be found if you go to um, brown.edu slash slaveryjustice. And it's not just these documents from the Sally, but documents from the entire kind of Brown family and as it relates to the slave trade. And um, they've done an absolutely amazing job. They're beautiful scans and they're all, um, and they're all transcribed. And they also have um, an exhibit also based on the Sally that's it's at one of our museums. But you can actually get the look at the panels online. And they have a lot of different teaching resources as well. Mm -hmm. It doesn't appear to be. We don't really know what happens to the Sally after this. Unfortunately, Sally is an incredibly popular name for ships in this period. Um, so you have to be careful. Like this is the Brig Sally versus the Ship Sally or the Snow Sally or the Bark Sally. Um, but we don't see the Sally never turns up again in another slave trading voyage. We know not long after this he does outfit a former slave ship for whaling. So with the timing of it, it is possible that sh this ship becomes a whaling ship. He never, he only does this kind of a, a one-off sort of whaling thing. It doesn't turn into a business for him. He realizes his profits are greater getting it from Massachusetts. Um, but they did often switch around what they were doing. So a slave ship, he takes this, this ship he already has to outfit it for the slave trade. He would have had them built, build a barracoon in it 
So this, this kind of wood, wooden barricade where the slaves would be kept when they were above deck um, to you know, protect them from insurrection, which didn't work out real well. Um, and they would have put in those holds that we saw, and they would have outfitted it in that way. So it was very specialized, but it does look like afterwards they just they outfitted it for a different trade and didn't continue. It's possible they could have also sold it as well. There were certainly a large number of other slave traders with whom they were friends and colleagues. Yeah. Yeah, we so we don't really know. We know the story was well known. You know, we do know that because we know that he heard about the death, the supposed death of Isak from other captains. We know there were 24 other traders from Rhode Island just on the coast, let alone who they were meeting up with in Antigua and, Bar and Barbados. And so by the time he, Isaac Hopkins, comes back to, um, to Providence with, as he calls them, the four likely lads, um, everyone is kind of celebrating that he's still alive. And so all of the captains in this community would have known well what had happened on the Sally. So you know, who knows what the reasons were. We just, we just do know that it doesn't show up again as one of his vessels. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that, those, this, the cobblestones were paid for off of taxes on slaves who were imported. So they were able to, yes, pave the streets of Colonial Newport with a uh, duty tax on, on enslaved people. So, yeah, it's, I mean, as I said, the signs are all around us. You know, we just, they're under our feet, they're, they're our walls, um, they're our chairs. We just have to know where to look and be willing to look at them. Um, some people have asked, you know, how can you even look at this stuff? It's just covered in blood. Um, unfortunately, um, most things are. Um, and Africa continues to be um, a continent that is exploited um, because of its vast resources. Um, and so even today, and what we talk about a lot with the students when they do this work, and the exhibit that's in the John Brown House Museum was largely put together by students from Brown, is the question of what does this all mean to us in terms of our responsibility today to paying attention to things like enslavement that still continues, to our environmental responsibility, to regions um, that were devastated by this kind of uh, exploitation. And so if we're not, in fact, you know, it's great to study history, but what lessons are we actually learning from it in terms of global economies and global responsibilities? And so that's, um, that's a lot of the questions that we have. So by looking at the past, you know, can we in fact use this to be better people now? Bloody flux. Yes. It was typically amoebic dysentery. Um, so the water supply is also being carried in these barrels, um, and things can easily get, you know, they don't have good desalinization techniques at this point. So if anything gets into the water, people are getting dysentery, and then it, you can imagine in the ship what, how this then transfers to just about everybody. Um, so, uh, so people have kind of tried to figure that out, but they're pretty sure amoebic dysentery is, is the answer for the flux. And yes, it is a slightly down, bit of a down note there, but <laughs> have great dinners, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming.